And we're back with our political panel. Molly Ball is with The Atlantic. David Ignatius is a columnist with The Washington Post. Ben Dominich is a publisher of The Federalist. And Ed O'Keefe covers politics for The Washington Post. Ed, I'll start with you. So Ben Carson and these stories about his, his autobiography, is this a threat or a gnat to be swatted away? I think he thinks it's a gnat to be swatted away. I think his opponents, as Mr. Trump demonstrated this morning, certainly plan to seize on it to some extent. I'm kind of fascinated by his response to all this, however. I mean, the idea that presidential candidates, especially those that suddenly start to do well, don't get vetted, don't get scrutinized a lot more. He's clearly struggling, I think, with this. And the suggestion that others have not gone through this, uh, you know, ignores history. I think if you go back to Gary Hart, Joe Biden, Bill Clinton, certainly President Obama, Herman Cain last time, this happens. And the real test is sort of how do they respond to this? Can they change the subject? Or does it ultimately, you know, derail their candidacy? Molly, in, in the case of his backstory, though, this isn't a central claim at the heart of it, right? I mean, his story is from poverty to famed neurosurgeon. The, the West Point is a little bit of a sideshow. It is. Well, and I think, I think Ed is right that the idea that a candidate would be vetted is not at all outrageous. But Ben Carson has won this round. I think there is no doubt. I think the fact that he had a plausible explanation for the West Point thing, uh, even if there was a, maybe a minor exaggeration, the, the original story did not hold up to scrutiny. And frankly, I think a lot of people want to see Ben Carson be tested because he hasn't been in politics before. Even if you support him for his story and for his beliefs, you want to to know that he can handle a little bit of scrutiny. And so far, he is handling it, I think, pretty pretty deftly. You know, you got under his skin, I thought, a little bit in that interview. He started to seem a little irritated. But for the most part, this is a man who keeps his cool. Yeah, Ben, he's raised a lot of money off of this. I mean, you in, you could argue that you basically couldn't design a better thing as a primary candidate. I mean, he gets to say, the press is after me, which keeps him from being asked questions again, and he gets to raise money off it. So as Molly says, he looks like he's won this round. Uh, I make it a general policy not to disagree with Molly uh, unless I think about it very seriously, and I agree with her in this case. I think this, inc this absolutely benefits Ben Carson. He is a candidate, of course, who is basing his entire campaign on his biography, on this narrative about his life. The one problem in the long term for candidates like that is that when that is the only basis they have, when they don't have the political career and record to uh, shift the conversation to whenever questions are raised about their biography, as we've seen in the past with other candidates, it gives them uh, less of an alternative point to make. I think in this case, uh, the mistake was a media entity going after a candidate, uh, basically saying that he was lying about something that he had never ex said exactly in those terms, and I think it, uh, it was therefore overplayed and certainly accrued to his benefit in the short term when it came to raising money. David, I, I talked to Dr. Carson about experience, and he, he wrote his supporters this week and said, you know, the signers of the Declaration of Independence didn't have a lot of experience. From a national security perspective, we're having a conversation this campaign about, does a senator have better experience, does a governor? But now you've got two people running, uh, three, I guess, if you include Carly Fiorina, without any of that experience. Give me your sense of what the test is. Can they just walk into the job of the president and have they, enough they, advisors? They shouldn't. Uh, the, the purpose of this period of the campaign is for hard questions to be asked uh, in debates, in uh, pieces of journalism that really dig of these, of these candidates. Uh, it, uh, unfortunately, this sometimes becomes the gotcha primary where instead of asking the fundamental question, is this person qualified? Does this person have a vision about national security or anything else? We instead focus in the media on small inconsistencies, gaffes, things we dig out 20 years ago. Eh, people get, get angry at that. But the fundamental work of asking, what would this person do as president? What really are their views? That's, that's what we need to really focus on. I hope we won't be pushed back by Ben Carson complaining about our, our questions and vetting, because that's that's a key job. But David, isn't there a problem here that has emerged that's not so much due to the media as it is due to the priorities of the people themselves? I mean, right now we just saw Donald Trump go on and demonstrate the qualities that one needs to be commander in chief in the modern era, which is an ability to dance to Drake and an ability <laughs> to send out particularly funny tweets. I mean, you know, frankly, if your attitude is that you're fine with the government offering people bread and circuses, you might as well hire the guy who seems like Barnum and Bailey. This is the sort of thing that I think is as much driven by the demand of the people for entertainment as it is the media actually asking questions here. If you really wanted to dig into policies uh, related to what Ben Carson uh, thought about uh, TPP or about trade, about, about foreign uh, relations or the like, that's probably going to get a lot less attention at this stage than asking him something about the pyramids. In the, in the end, it's going to come down to voters. 
and if voters are satisfied with the kind of uh, hucksterism that some candidates have or the ability to be a great reality TV st star, that's going to be decisive in the primaries. We'll see the numbers soon. Uh, a lot of me thinks it won't be, but uh, you know, we've never had a primary season quite like this, I <laughs> one have to the, say. You know, one of the candidates, Ed, who hopes that the conversation will move back towards the serious <laughs> business of governing is Jeb Bush. So he is... I got a, been trying to reboot this week. He's had a, a, a bus tour. He's t had done a lot of interviews, um, talked compellingly about his daughter's uh, struggle with addiction. Where, and there's a debate coming up with, with the Republicans, where does the Bush campaign stand and is this debate, uh, you know, make or break for him? I, I think it is another make or break moment. I think the last one certainly broke him a little bit. Um, you know, and he's, he slid farther back. He is no longer center stage. He is in single digits nationally and in these early states, despite spending millions of dollars. Last week was reboot. This coming week, I think, is even more critical because it's can you can you keep to this new theme? Can you can you remain as disciplined and as on message as you were last week? His campaign is downsized. Uh, there's no doubt that, that staffers have taken pay cuts. It's, they've parted ways with others. They've reassigned a bunch to the early states. But this is still a guy who wants to be everywhere as much as possible. And the question will be, can he really focus relentlessly, solely, on places like New Hampshire, maybe South Carolina, a little bit in his home state of Florida, and just keep doing that circuit. John Kasich, Chris Christie proved that if you focus on one place and one place only, your numbers will rise and potentially sparks will fly and you'll do well everywhere else. But, you know, the other thing that was stunning about this week, that, that book that came out about his father, uh, you know, the idea that one former president is, is critiquing another former president in a tell-all is unprecedented to begin with. The fact that they're both related to somebody running and this creates new questions about his family and what he believes and whether he agrees with his brother or his dad, uh, you know, just creates another headache for him at a really, really tough well, David, time. What did you make of that book, the, uh, John Meachman's book about George Herbert Walker Bush? I thought it, it captured the, a fundamental dilemma for, for Jeb. Is he, is he with, his, with his brother, Bush 43, or is he with his dad, Bush 41? His dad was so critical of the neoconservative advisors, people around uh, Bush 43. Those are the very people that Jeb has drawn into his campaign as advisors. You'd have to say, in the Bush family primary, Jeb is voting for his brother over his father in recent months. Molly, the rest of the Republican field, Chris Christie not making the debate stage. Uh, as Ed mentioned, he was gaining some ground in New Hampshire not making, is that a big deal? Where do you think the rest of the race stands? It's a big deal for him and for Mike Huckabee, who also got kicked off the big stage. We are seeing a narrowing. Now, maybe it's a forced narrowing. People aren't actually dropping out. It's kind of remarkable that no one has dropped out since Scott Walker saw the writing on the wall. But we do have the debate now coming down to eight people. Jeb, as, as, as Ed said, is moving farther and farther from the center of that stage, and there's only so far you can get out to the wings. Uh, I think, you know, it, it, Trump is still in the middle of that stage. He is still the front runner, and this has been a durable phenomenon that has lasted for months and months. And part of what I think you see happening is that his support has solidified. People have wandered away from him. You saw a dip for him, and then he went back up because people didn't find anybody else that they liked. Mm -hmm. So I think we see voters who maybe once just glommed onto Trump because he was interesting now hardening because they. Don't see anything better out there in the field. 30 seconds. There is an effort on the part of backers of Marco Rubio to really make a push at this moment to push forward the endorsements, push forward the backers, and to push Jeb Bush and others out of the race. They realize he needs to solidify that support in order to position himself for the long haul. The alternative person to the Trump Carson exactly. side of the. All right. We're going to pause there. We'll be back with our panel in just a moment. Stay with us. And we're back with more of our panel. David, I want to talk to you about this, the Russian plane and the claims of responsibility by ISIS. What's your take on this? Uh, as the evidence grows that this was a bomb that brought down the, the Russian plane over, over Sinai, I think it's causing some fundamental concern. The analytical view of ISIS was that they were so focused on building their caliphate that they were not seeking external actions. They were not, uh, other than these lone wolf attacks, isolated, not all that, all, all that damaging, uh, going after the big targets, Al-Qaeda style. Uh, this uh, 
shoot down of the plane, if that's what it proves to be, will change that assessment. Also, as Michael Morrell said earlier on your show, the demonstration effect of this for other groups and for other branches of ISIS who look at this, look at the uproar that it's causing, cancellation of flights, and say, we want to get in that game too, that's a, that's a real problem. Does that change the response from the U.S. in terms of combating? The U.S. is in a very tricky position. The, U the U.S., uh, I was told this morning, is seeking to be helpful to Russia and to Egypt in, in this investigation, providing intelligence. But the U.S. does not want to signal to Russia that uh, it's back to business as usual. There's an insistence. And as long as you have troops uh, in uh, eastern Ukraine, as long as the Crimea issue isn't resolved, we are not going to embrace you as a common ally against ISIS. But this seriously is a situation where you have the Russians have uh, an opportunity to demonstrate to, uh, once again, that they are a more reliable patron in the Middle East than the United States, which is a real danger at this stage. We've seen it happen before, and it's going to continue. Obviously, there are risks for Putin in terms of the domestic ones, as, as Michael Morrell made uh, issue of earlier in terms of seeing you're just like another Western nation experiencing blowback. But it's also a situation where the president really should be talking to the Egyptians, I feel like, and demonstrating that we are going to be a reliable patron. All right, we're going to switch back to politics now. Molly, uh, the Des Moines Register has a headline today that reads, as Iowa debate approaches, Clinton seems inevitable again. Is that where the Democratic race stands? Inevitable she, Clinton? She is in a commanding position. I mean, there are only three candidates left, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, and uh, they, uh, oh, and Martin O'Malley, who is, uh, right, what's his name and again? And your, <coughs> your, your, your iPhone is now filled with emails <laughs> from his campaign, go ahead. <laughs> Completely failed to, to, but you know, Bernie has fallen back since Hillary has had a sort of a run of good news. The debate performance, if she pulls off another debate performance like the last one, it, you know, it's just going to be more of this narrative, I think, that she is on top by a, by a wide margin and nobody seems to be able to knock her off. And, you know, I, I think looking ahead, obviously unexpected things could happen. We in the media get bored when there's no conflict and may try to start some trouble. I think that's part of what this, oh, Bernie's gone negative mm. uh, theme has been about is just the desperate desire for some kind of real contest. But barring something unexpected, you know, potentially she wins Iowa and the whole thing is over. Ed, Bernie's gone negative. If he's gone negative, he's gone there in slow steps. I mean, he hasn't really... And, and, and somewhat reluctantly, I think. Yeah. And, and, and really, it's on the margins. And, and, and what's fascinating, too, is the pushback he's gotten either subtly or explicitly from the Clinton camp is the idea of sexism. And I think, you know, it would be very interesting to see how he rides that out in the next few months, but then also inevitably how Republicans handle that. I think they, there is, there are lessons to be learned from her previous campaigns. I think Rick Lazio certainly has the wounds to remind us from 2000 of how you campaign against a woman like her. Uh, but it will be very interesting to see if Sanders comes up with anything that sticks and raises fresh doubts with, with liberal voters, especially about her, because so far in the last few weeks, nothing has stuck. And I think it's also part of the reason why, why Republicans are getting anxious. You talked about it, Ben, about the idea of consolidating, that the sooner they can do that, the sooner they can focus their fire on her and not be squabbling among themselves and potentially blow an opportunity. I feel like in this situation, uh, Bernie Sanders has enormous opportunities to be more critical of Hillary Clinton, particularly when it comes to the news this week that she did sign this non-disclosure agreement as it related to, uh, to the material related to her emails. I feel like this is a situation where if Bernie wanted to be more critical of her as a commander in chief, as a potential president, then he could be. I think that the fact that he isn't kind of sends the message that this is more about the ideas that he wants to espouse as opposed mm -hmm. to actually trying to win the nomination. David, I want to play, we're going to play a quick clip from President Obama here talking about the Republicans and their debate um, anger at the CNBC moderators. It turns out they can't handle a bunch of CNBC moderators. <laughs> if you can't handle those guys, You know, then I don't think the Chinese and the Russians are going to be too worried about you. David, I play that because it seems like he's in a sweet spot before a nominee gets named where he can kind of have fun at the, at the uh, 
Republicans' expense. What did you make of that? Uh, I thought it was, it was a great line, and I thought there was some truth to it. The, the Republican debate may have been a disaster for the, for the media asking the questions, but I didn't think the Republican candidates came out of very well. And, and all of the squabbling, unfair, the media is so mean, they're, they're asking nasty questions. I think that makes uh, the Republican candidates, it diminishes them. And uh, if they stay on that, it may work with some Republican primary base voters, but I can't imagine that it's going to be effective with, with the electorate as a whole. The people are looking for someone who can be commander in chief, and that's not the person who whines about media coverage. Well, we'll have a chance to see you on Tuesday night. Unfortunately, we're going to have to end it there. Ben, I'm sorry, as your moderator, to cut you off. <laughs> These mean moderators. Yes, look, there you go. <laughs> Thanks <again>. to all <laughs> of you. We'll be right back. That's all we have time for today. Be sure to tune in next Saturday for the CBS News Democratic Debate at Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, live at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 Pacific. Plus, Face the Nation will be broadcasting from the debate site the next morning. Till next week, for Face the Nation, I'm John Dickerson.